I'm camping, I'm camping in Canaan Tampa land. Out of Egypt I have traveled through the darkness, weary, far over hills and valleys, and across the desert sand. But I've landed safe at home where I shall not grow weary. I'm a camping, I'm a camping in a gain and happy land. Every day I'm camping in the land of Canaan. And with rapture I survey it wondrously enshrined. Lord, hallelujah, I have found the land of promise. I'm a camping, I'm a camping in a gain and happy land. Yes, reach the land of promise with the scenes of glory. My journey ended in a place so lovely and so grand. I lived by Jesus to this place of land of glory. I'm camping, I'm camping, in a Canaan's happy land. Every day I'm camping in the land of Canaan. And with rapture I survey a wonder beauty grand. Lord, hallelujah, I have found the land of promise. I'm camping, I'm camping in a Canaan's happy land. Coming down. Yeah. See, maybe see. See, I think. See. Jesus has a table spread where the saints of God are fed. He invites his chosen people to come and dine. With his manna, he does feed and supplies our every need. Hold the street to sup with Jesus all the time. Come and dine, Master Golden, come and dine. You may feed to Jesus' table all the time. He who fed the multitude turns water into one. To the hungry calleth now, come and dine. The disciples came to land, thus obeying Christ's command. For the master called to them, oh, come and dine. There they found the heart's desire, bread and fish upon the fire. As he satisfies the hungry every time. Come and dine, master called and come and dine. You may feast at Jesus' table all the time. You fed the multitude. To the hungry called now, come and die. Soon the lamb will take his bride to be ever at his side. All the hosts of heaven will assemble be. Oh, it will be a glorious sight. All the saints in spot is white. And with Jesus they will be eternally. Come and dine, Master Golden, come and dine. You may feast at Jesus' table all the time. You fed the multitude, turned water into wine. To the hungry call of town, come and
Are we on? Yes. Good morning, happy warriors. <laughs> you should be happy. Amen. Amen. And you should be a warrior. Amen. And uh, if you need any proof in that, just look at our world around us because it is a battle every day. All right, we want to welcome those who are joining us by Facebook. Thank you for being a part of our service. Invite you to be with us when you can come. It is an experience to be here in the church, the family, the people of God, right? Amen. Amen. All right, happy birthdays. This coming week is Doris Durham. Amen. Happy birthday, Doris, on the 27th. Also on the 27th, Phil Marshall. Amen. All right, so we want to wish those happy birthdays. No anniversaries this week. Now, any birthdays or anniversaries I may have overlooked? Any? All right, let's sing happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. And many, many more. All right. All right. Okay, very good. All right, we do not take up an organized offering. We do have a leather can at each of the entrances. However, the Lord leads your heart in that matter. They are there for your convenience. All right. This coming week, we have our first Wednesday service on March 1st. So we'll begin the month with our Wednesday night services at 7 o'clock. So I ask you to remember that and uh, be a part of that where we learn more and more about what God's Word says says to us we dig a little deeper on Wednesday nights all right uh, also then next Monday will be the first Sunday of the month which is March 5th and so at 8 a.m. is our men's prayer breakfast so remind you about that and invite you to join us for breakfast and then at 9 a.m. is the women's Bible study so both of those things will be next Sunday. Today, after the service, there will be an Easter play practice. So uh, if you're a part of that, I invite you to stay and uh, we'll do uh, kind of a run through and, and begin to hone down our uh, Easter play to the point that we're ready to perform that. Okay, uh, let's see what, ah, yes. Also today, if you happen to miss it, can you miss this? It's pretty green. Uh, but we do have March's newsletter out. And so if you want to know how to be a gracious warrior, I invite you to read the newsletter on the front page. But in addition to that, uh, we are celebrating in March, all this year really with our newsletter, different pictures of how our church was founded. And this March 7th, 30 years ago, the Cowboy Church had their first service in a cell barn, and, um, and so we celebrate that as the beginning of our church family on March 7th, 1993. And so there are pictures in there uh, throughout the year in our newsletter. <clears throat> and one of the things that we've been doing periodically is to uh, give you some information about the founding of our church, and specifically coming from Cowboy Christians a book that was written by uh, Mary Dallum or Marie Dallum, and uh, she does a good job of, uh, of describing how cowboy Christianity, if you want to call it that, but how the word of God was disseminated to cowboys. And throughout uh, the 1700s all the way through uh, the early 2000s. But I wanted to read something to you that might be a very... Uh, very close uh, importance to us as a cowboy church in Henrietta, Texas. And it's about the cowboy churches of the 1990s. And it says this, what we find is that in the 1990s there was little coherence among cowboy churches, primarily because each one started independently, even when founders were aware of other examples. The Cowboy Church of Henrietta, Texas is perhaps best known for being the creator and owner of the iconic image that has come to represent not only cowboy churches, but 
cowboy Christianity more boldly. A cowboy kneeling at the cross with bowed head, his horse by his side. The original version is a larger-than-life sculpture positioned on a hill above Highway 287, just a stone's throw away from the single-story church building. The sculpture's cross is built of bridge timber set in a rock, while the horse and cowboy are two-dimensional pieces cut from steel. Randy Wood designed the image using his father as the model for the cowboy. And the second model was a horse named Miss Kitty, who belonged to the church member Donna G. Lights illuminate the piece so that it can be seen from a distance at night. The sculpture dates to the winter of 1997-1998, and the church subsequently registers its own rights simply to prevent someone from staking a claim to the image. They make it known that the image can be freely used by others. And so now you have a little bit of history of not only our cross and the cowboy church or the cowboy kneeling with his horse behind him, but the symbol that you see around the world. And I know this for a fact. Number one, we see it in the Philippines with the cowboy church of the Philippines. It's the same emblem they use. But the first time that I went to Israel, saw the same symbol in the Golan Heights on a little church in the Golan Heights. Can't remember what the name was, but I just saw the symbol. So be gracious to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that that started here. And know that in your heart that we have been a part of spreading God's message worldwide by a cross, a horse, and a cowboy. And that cowboy is kneeling. And that's where we should be on a daily basis. All right. I think that's all. Brother Don, will you lead us? Oh, we do have a special today. Uh, and so Chrissa and Melissa and Ashley's going to whisper the words, right? Because she's lost her voice. <laughs> so we look forward to their participation. <laughs> Blessed assurance. <coughs> Blessed Blessed assurance. Jesus is mine. Oh, what a fortress of glory divine. Heir of salvation. Purchase of God, born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight, visions of rapture now burst on my sight. Angels descending Rain from above, echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. Song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I in my Savior am happy and blessed. Watch 
watching and waiting, looking above, filled with his goodness, lost in his love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. I saw the light. I wonder so aimless, life filled with sin. I wouldn't let my dear Savior in. Then Jesus came like a stranger in the night. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. I saw the light, oh, I saw the light. No more darkness, no more night. Now I'm so happy, no sorrow inside. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. Just like a blind man, I wandered along. Worries and fears I claimed for my own. Then like a blind man, God came back to sight. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. I saw the light, I saw the light, no more dark. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. I was a fool to wander and stray. For straight is the gate and narrows the way. Now I have traded the wrong for the right. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. I saw the light, oh, I saw the light, no more darkness, no more night. Now I'm so happy, no sorrow inside. Praise the Lord, I saw the Oh, I've had I've been talking to God a lot this morning. Um, I feel like the devil was just trying to get to my anxiousness as we prepared for live praise and worship this morning. And um, Ashley lost her voice between last week and today, and she, yeah, Melissa is self-inflicted, <coughs> um, but. Melissa and Robert were able, weren't were able to come to practice this last week, and so it was Ashley and me practicing, and now Ashley's not helping this morning. <laughs> and then Robert had truck trouble this morning on the way in, um, and we usually try to practice um, before, um, Sunday mornings before we start, but um, I just feel like that's the world we live in. It's a broken world, and um, I think none of us are immune to the devil working in our lives or trying to and I know it's cliche but I do often use that saying that you see on t-shirts not today Satan because it makes me kind of just set my jaw 
and dig in whenever there's negative things that happen. Um, and so this morning for a special, I'm going to sing th- a song called Goodness of God, and I'm sure you've heard it on the radio um, if you listen to Christian music. And um, I just feel like there's so much to it, especially it, it speaks to my life. Um, it says, all my life you've been faithful, all my life you've been so, so good. And then there's also a part where it says, I've known you as a father and I've known you as a friend. And um, that's been so true in my life when I've gone through hard times that, man, I, he's not there physically to give me a hug, but I feel his presence. And um, I don't have a dad living on this earth right now. Uh, my dad passed away, and so um, I've, I've adopted God as my dad. Uh, and I think he always has been, but like I just feel a, a stronger bond with him now that I don't have my earthly father here. So I love you, Lord. For your mercy never fails me All my days I've been held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Till I lay my head I will sing of the goodness of God And yes, you can join me
actually you can remain standing <laughs> for praise and worship <clears throat> please please join us Water you turn into wine, open the eyes of the blind, there's no one like you, none like you, into the darkness you shine, out of the ashes we rise, there's no one like you. God is greater, our God is stronger, God you are higher than any other, our God is healer, awesome in power, our God, our God, into the darkness you shine, out of the ashes we rise. greater our God is stronger God you are higher than any other our God is healer awesome in power our God our God Dale Waldrop had asked me to learn this song to do for praise and worship and I'd heard it um, at least once and I thought wow that's a tall ask because um, that is, by the <laughs> way it's one of my favorites <laughs> why I'm getting a drink right now because it's it's a tall ask but the words are so amazing and I wanted to oh I just wanted to motivate this morning um, because our God is um, the greatest, and, uh, you know, we, we get so discouraged, but the, the title of the song is Believe for It.
If any of you women were at the women's retreat that they had a while back, there was one song from that night, my goodness, man, it just gripped my heart, and I'm like, I have never heard that song before, and I tried to remember the lyrics, and I had um, our neighbor with me, and as we were driving home, I was like, there was one song, and she's like, I know the song, I, and so we're like trying to remember what the lyrics were, and we located it, and I, it's just, it was so impactful on me, and um, I hope that this kind of just sets the tone for um, the message today. When you speak, confusion fades. Just a Everything you say is life to me. I don't want to miss one word you speak. Quiet my heart, I'm listening. When sorrows roar and troubles rage, you whisper. Storms won't break. 
to keep your word. Your promises will keep me safe, and I don't want to miss one word you speak, because everything you say is life to me. I don't want to miss one word you speak. Quiet my Thank you, Father God, for this day, for your love and grace. Thank you for helping Chris and I with these songs. We can't do it without your Holy Spirit. And Father God, we thank you for this church and for the opportunity to come in your name. And we thank you for Pastor Larry and for blessing him with the anointing of being able to teach and preach to us. And we ask you to bless him and his family. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank y'all so much. Did you enjoy it? <laughs> I appreciate Chris and Melissa and them, you know, trying to get us into some new and a little bit different praise and worship. And so support them all you can. If you can't sing, well, at least hum real loud. <laughs> amen, amen. Uh, children can be dismissed three through nine for Children's Church. Intermediate class can also be dismissed at this time. I uh, want to welcome our Facebook viewers. Appreciate you tuning in. Uh, enjoy the comments and the feedback we receive. And uh, like I say, anything we can help you with, well, let us know. Rest, if you would, turn to Matthew 21, Mark 9 and 11, Luke 17, Hebrews 4 and 6. Beginning with Matthew 21, Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, If you have faith and doubt not, you shall not only do this which is done to the fig tree, but also you shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and it shall be done. And all things, whatsoever you ask in prayer, believing, you shall receive. Mark 9, 23, Jesus said unto him, If you can hope, all things or some things are possible to him that hopes. No, that's not what it said. How many things are possible? Oh. Put it back up there, James. We're going. What's the condition? Oh. You have to believe. It doesn't say if you're on 10 prayer list or whatsoever. 
But Jesus said unto him, If you can believe, if you can believe, all things are possible to him that believes. Mark eleven twenty three. For verily I say unto you, that whoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe those things which he says shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he says. Therefore I say unto you, what things you ever desire, when you pray, believe you receive them, and you shall have them. Luke 17, 16. Uh, I've got the wrong one. I think should, that's fine. It should be Luke 17, 6. It says, if you say unto a sick mind tree, be thou plucked up, cast into the sea, should obey you. So I've got that. That's, I'll take responsibility for that. Hebrews 4, 2. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as to them, but the word preached, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. 6.12, that you be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. I'm going to ask Thomas Hobson if he would have blessed the word this morning. Amen, amen. I believe today's message is for each and every one of us because I think somewhere in there you're going to fall in one of these categories. You're here today, maybe you have a need. Maybe you're here today and you have a problem. Maybe that problem looks like Mount Everest. It's just impossible to ever get over, to get through. You know, Mark 11, 23, 24 tells us how to get your mountains moved how to get your problems solved, how to get your needs taken care of. It also tells us if you have a desire, maybe you're here today and you have a desire for a better marriage, for a healthy body, or maybe just peace of mind. Maybe you desire a godly mate or your, or your children seeking and serving God. Well, Mark 11, 23, 24 tells you how to obtain that desire. It says in verse 24, what things soever you desire. You know, the smartest thing I believe that you can do, to me, these scriptures are kind of the bread and butter of the Gospels, is make, take your index cards and write these verses on them. Make book markers out of them, maybe Bible markers, but they're constantly there all the time. Put them on the icebox, put them on your vanity, uh, put them on your dashboard when you drive, or just put them in your pocket and keep them before your eyes daily. When Joshua went in to take the promised land, God told him, said, Keep your, you know, the word before your eyes constantly. I think you need to read these verses constantly all during the day because the word says faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. There are three things to me about Mark 11, 23, 24 that allow us to have confidence and faith in what it's saying. Uh, the first thing is this. This scripture or basically the same thing is said in Mark 11, 23, 24. We find it in Matthew 21, 21, 22, and like I say, Luke 17, 6. And the Bible says every word is to be established by two or more witnesses. Now, we, a lot of times we see people and they will make a doctrine or belief out of just one verse in the Bible. They take it out of context and then they'll stand on it and so forth. Well, you have the assurance that this is said three times in the Bible. The second reason I think you can have confidence in it, they're easy to understand. To me, they're not open for interpretation. You know, you don't have to have a degree to understand them. It's just very plain and simple. The third thing is this. It applies to each and every one of us. It says, whosoever, whosoever says unto this mountain. I just wanted to say, how many of you are whosoever? Amen. Praise God. Everyone, you know, a lot of times you hear people say, well, now that was just for the disciples in that particular time, and that's not what these verses say. You know, some are here today, and I know you're thinking to me, oh, that's all Brother Larry wants to do is preach Mark 11, 23, 24. You're right. And some of you are here today and say, you know, well, I've heard this before, <clears throat> and, and that's fine. But the question is, are you doing them? You know, are you doing them? You could know something, but that doesn't mean you do it. How many of us know we need to eat right and lose weight?
but do we do it? Me and Terry have started diets five different days this last week, you know. So I'm not preaching at you. I'm agreeing with you. We need the exercise to get in shape. How many of us do it? We need to spend less money. But how many of us do that? So you can know something, agree with it, but if you don't do it, it doesn't help you whatsoever. We want the promises of God. We want the promises of God, but here's the problem. We're not willing to meet the conditions. We're not willing to walk in the steps to see our mountains move. Let's look at step number one we find in Mark eleven twenty four 24 and Matthew 21, 22. Matthew 21, 22 says, And all things, say that with me, all things, whatsoever you ask in prayer, believing, you shall receive. Mark eleven twenty four 24 says, Therefore I say unto you, what things soever you desire, when you pray, believe you receive them, and you shall have them. Uh, the best thing I can give you is say you got this warehouse, and in that warehouse, it's like God's warehouse. And everything you need to live an abundant, overcoming life in that warehouse. But it's locked, you know. Don't want the devil's crowd to come up there and take you. So you go up there. Now, what unlocks it? Lock? Prayer. Well, you can unlock the door and stand there forever and not get anything. Faith is what goes in and takes it and breaks it appropriated to you, to your particular need, to your particular desires and wishes. Prayer is the key that unlocks it, gives you access, and opens it up. God says you have not because you ask not. And then faith goes in and takes it, makes a reality in your life. You, I want you to understand this. Where we get in trouble a lot of times, we're not asking or praying for God for things that are in his word. And every prayer you pray should be based on the word of God. Because your faith will never go beyond what you believe is God's will. And the reason a lot of people don't receive healing for their body, they're just not sure it's God's will. I mean, you hear things from the pulpit. Well, it just wasn't God's will to heal, you know, just so forth. And a lot of people are held in sickness by a lot of religious false teaching by good people, good godly men and women, but they have bought into that over the years. We can believe for salvation because God's Word says it's available to each and every one of us. It says, it's not God's will that any should perish. Now, why do you have to pray? Do you ask yourself, well, why, God knows I need this. Why didn't he just give it to me? Because God has placed limits on himself. And he will not force salvation on anyone. He will not make anyone accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. Because you have a free will. And the time comes that he ever forces you to do something, then you no longer have a free will to do it. Now, he can bring you right to the verge to where you've got, you've got to make a decision, do I accept this or not? But he will not force you over that line. That's where your free will comes in. So what you need to do, and what I've suggested to people, find the scriptures that promise your desires, promises your need, promises your problem to be solved, write it down. I like to date it, write it down, and put it in a Bible. And every time that thought pops up in your mind, remind God, in your mind, remind God of what the Word says. Now, Father, your Word says this. I mean, how many of you, when you're a kid, when your dad promised you something, you didn't have a second thought about reminding him, now, you said you'd do this. And I don't know of any dad that's worth his salt if he told his kids he'd do something that he wouldn't do it, especially when they remind him. Do you understand it thrills God when you remind him what his word says? Absolutely thrills him. I can just almost see him up there now. He says, Gabriel, man, you got to go down and take care of it. These people believe me. You know, they just said what I said, and I want you to go down and make sure that's handled. So that's the first step. You have to ask in prayer. Step number two, we find in Matthew 21, 21, Mark 11, 23, is what we say determines if mountains are moved in our life, if our desires are met. It says, whosoever shall say unto this mountain, shall believe what he says shall come to pass, shall have what he says. Our confession, our confession is so important when we, what we say over our needs, our problems, and our desires. 
Proverbs 18, 21 says, death and life are in the power of the tongue. I don't say get him playing that. He says, what comes out of your mouth determines whether or not you experience death or life in your situation whatsoever. You know, the cause, and I've said this before and going to keep saying, the cause of most of our problems, our troubles, or, or not seeing our desires met is right under our nose. It's our mouth. Yeah. It, it's got where when I hear people say negative things, it bothers me worse than to hear people cuss. I, I just, don't, I mean, I just, it's just something that just, it's just like scratching your fingers down a blackboard. I just can't hardly handle it. But let me ask you this. Are you confessing what God's Word says? Are you confessing your feelings, your circumstances? Well, yeah, I, I just got up this morning and just felt terrible. I'll tell you what, I, I probably know I've shared it before, but my first PT man on my knee, the, one of the first things that come out of his mouth was how important attitude was. You know, and I said, well, man, I got a man at church, Pete Johnson, and his life he taught about attitude. And I said, I agree with you 100%. If you get up in the morning and think it's going to be a terrible day, Odds are it's going to be, you know. I, I'll tell you this. I seen it last night, and it blessed me beyond measure. And they showed this little boy on TV, and he'd have any legs. But he was dancing on his stubs. Had a smile on his face, you know, and just a joy to be around. And I thought, thank God. We get so ground down on stuff that doesn't amount to anything. And then we see somebody like that, and you know what? We got it pretty good. We got it pretty good. And if anybody really had an excuse for being down, down in the dumps, that little boy did. But he didn't let it get down. He had an attitude that he was going to be happy and enjoy. Some of you need an attitude adjustment. <laughs> you know, some of you still say, thank you, Lord, good morning. It's, good morning. It's going to be terrible today, you know. I hate to even get up and get started. No. The Bible says this is the day the Lord's given us, and we need to rejoice and be glad in it. And that needs to be our attitude. People say, well, I just feel so sick. I just, just feel broke. So what comes out of your mouth is negative. Things are never going to change. Things are just getting worse. Your words produce results, good or bad. And if you read Mark 11, 23, 24, Matthew 21, 21, 22, you find out where Jesus cursed a fig tree. And his just words caused that fig tree to die. And you know what? We have that same ability within us. Our words can cause problems to die and to go away. Or they can cause them to increase if we want to speak negative about it. You know, I love Charles Capps on confession. I listened to him this morning. And, and I just love his book. I've, I've tried to read some of it every week. And in his book, he talks about the necessity of speaking to our bodies. And, and I'm a big believer in that, you know. I've told you before, it's just like I've, I've had high blood pressure since I was a kid, you know. Uh, it kept me from going to Vietnam, you know. I've always had it. It's not extremely high, but it's always, they'll go in there, you know, and I thought they're going to want to put me on cholesterol medicine, blood thinners, and all this or that. But I got to the point to where every day or once a week, I would call my blood pressure 120 over 80. Don't know what it was. Didn't care what it was. But I began to speak that. Every time that they've come in and took my blood pressure in the last six or seven weeks on PT, it's been 130 over 80. Now, I'm telling you, I've never had it before. It is so important, begin to speak to your body, begin to speak to whatever you're dealing with. Your heart, begin to speak healing and health over your heart, all other organs in your body. Call them out one by one and call them physically and speak healing and health over them. You know, years ago, Caps had a subdivision, and there were two houses in that division that hadn't sold. And one day he was asking the Lord, he said, Lord, why, why haven't those houses sold? And the Lord said, you haven't done what my word says, what I said to do. Well, Caps got the message. He drove up to the houses, and he began to speak to them. He said, listen to me. I mean, you get this in your picture. He drove up to this house. 
Someone's impressed with you, and you will be a blessing to them. And I called you sold in Jesus' name. He said, now, they didn't sell overnight. And then Satan began to come against him. Satan's going to always try to come against you to keep you from receiving what God wants you to have. I mean, he never gives up. And Satan said, now what are you going to do? So what Caps did, he just drove up to the houses, and he just laughed at them in the name of Jesus. And then shortly after, the houses, and that whole subdivision sold. So there's so much power. If you can speak to houses and stuff, you can speak to your body, to your situation. Are you confessing blessings or curses on your situations, on your needs, your desires? Be honest about it. Well, what are you saying? I've said it before, I'm going to say it again. You cannot be negative in your confession and expect to receive from God because your confession is an expression of your faith. And you're experiencing today what you spoke yesterday, the day before, and the day before that. It's become a reality in your life, in your house, in your home whatsoever. You know, I don't believe it's an accident that Jesus used a tree to show us the power of the words we speak. You know, can you imagine what they thought when he went up to that fig tree and began to speak to it? Begin to curse it, tell it to wither and die? I mean, I, sometimes you just begin to imagine what people are thinking in the background. You know, I'm going to tell you this. People think you're crazy when you begin to speak to things. When you begin to call things that are not as though they are. I mean, uh, the, to me, the, the funniest scenario in the Bible had to be Abraham. I mean, this man didn't have one child, and every time someone met him and said Abraham, they were calling him father of many nations. And I can't help but believe the people in the background, probably if he, because he is rich and wealthy, they wouldn't say anything. But in the background, thinking, this old man's got dementia, you know, Alzheimer's. He's losing it. He ain't got one kid, and he called himself father of many nations. But you know what? He got the last laugh. And that's the same thing will happen to you when you begin to speak and confess God's word over your situation, over your problem. I was reading the other day in this testimony in uh, Kenneth Hagin's prayer study course. And years when he first started out in ministry, he was preaching a revival in a small country church, and they, all they had to heat was wood stoves. and come a big norther through there, very, very cold. Well, those wood stoves, you didn't have any way to control them, so it would get very hot in the building. So he was preaching one night, and it got very hot in there. When he stepped outside, he said the cold air hit him and said immediately his throat started to hurt. He said by the time he got to his car, he could hardly talk. The next day, he couldn't even talk above a whisper. And he said his chest started to hurt. Well, what he did, he started reading healing scriptures. And he said, Lord, your word tells me I'm healed. My flesh and people... If, they were, if you were to ask them if I were healed, they'd say no. If you were to ask my feelings if I were healed, they'd say no. But your word says, let God be true, but every man a liar. So if I say I'm not healed, I'm a liar. Because your word says you cannot lie, and your word says I'm healed. When he got to church that night to preach, he told the Lord, he said, I'm going to church tonight and preach. And when he got up to preach, he went up to the mic, and he said, I want to thank God that I'm healed. And the congregation looked at him like he was crazy because he could just barely whisper. He began to share about the word says about healing, and he told them what God said is true, and if I said I wasn't healed, I'd be lying. He asked them to all stand and praise God with him that I, that I was healed. He said, some stood and began to praise God with him. And he said, I hadn't said hallelujah three times till his voice immediately returned. And he said, I preached up a storm. Begin to confess what the word says, not what your circumstances, not what your body or anything else says. You begin to confess what the word says. Step number three. One of the conditions, you're going to have to walk in faith. Do you know the book, the Bible is a book of faith from cover to cover? That's what it's all about. Mark eleven twenty four. 24, what things do every desire? When you pray, believe you receive them and you shall have them. 
When did Jesus say you ever believe you received? When it happens, when it gets better, when it looks promising. No, when you pray. When you pray. Faith calls it done now before it ever materializes. Hope says I'll get it someday. You just listen to how much hope comes out of people's mouth. Well, I hope this happens. I hope that happens. I hope this turns around. I hope this and this. And their statements are hope and not faith. Hope says I'll get someday. Abraham called himself father of many nations before one son, before he even had one son. In James 1, 6, it says that we're to ask in faith nothing wavering. Because if you waver, you're double-minded. And double-mindedness is a problem within most believers. And I'm not getting up here and say I can walk at all these steps and do it all the time. But just because we can't doesn't mean we shouldn't try and shouldn't try to get better at it. And receiving healing and other things, let me tell you what happens. People will come to church on Sunday, and they'll hear a message, and they walk out here, and they're ready to jump on Goliath. They're just full of faith as they can be. And before too long, as soon as Satan turns up the heat a little bit, and the symptoms jump up, then before too long, they begin to waver in their faith and in their beliefs. They begin to waver in their faith and their belief when something happens to someone and they can't understand it. Let me ask you this. Can you stand in faith when things get worse in your situation, your problem? Can you still believe God? Can you stand in faith when the doctor comes in and gives you a bad report? Can you still stand in faith when everything breaks down and you've been believing God that everything's going... I told you before, when Terry and I really got in the Word and, and believe in God for stuff, we got where we were just didn't want to go home. We just knew something was going to break down when we got there. But you know what? We stood. We kept standing for too long. It went the other way. Can you still stand in faith while your children are out running around in the world? Can you still call them, uh, you know, children of God, seeking, serving God, honoring Him? And then Mark eleven twenty three 23 says, Believe that those things he says, sh says shall and not might shall come to pass. Shall come to pass. It doesn't say without difficulty. Some people got this idea, well, as long as you're serving God, everything will go rosy. You know, you look at David, and, and God has given us examples in the Bible. You look at David in the wilderness. I mean, he had to go through that before he ascended to be king over Israel. It doesn't say that things shall come to pass without some setbacks. Joseph, he, you know, in the pit, in the prison, so forth. So you may experience some setbacks. And you've got a choice. You can either quit and give up or you can just stand on the word and keep speaking the word. It doesn't say it shall come to pass immediately. Abraham was 12 years to get his son. 12 years. It took years for Joseph to become prime minister. So just because it doesn't happen immediately, that you have setbacks and there's difficulty, does not mean it's not going to happen. It just gives you an opportunity to stand more and to grow stronger in your faith and your beliefs. It doesn't say it shall come to pass the way you think it should. God's ways are not our ways. I hope you know that, you know. He doesn't do things on our schedule or on our time clock in the way we think it should be done. Uh, and when I go back over my life, you know, everything that ever happened, it happened, but it wasn't the way I had it planned out. But you know what? I figured out one day God's smarter than I am, and he knows what he's doing. And he, he's not shook because it takes a little while or something or whatever. You know, there are different ways to move mountains in the natural realm. You can take dynamite and just blow it down. Or you take a bulldozer, it takes longer or slower, you can bulldoze it down. Or you can even take a shovel and a pick, take a lot longer, and take it down. So there are different ways to move mountains. In the spiritual realm, when, when Israel's back was against the Red Sea, now, I don't know about you, but I figured he'd call it a cruise ship and ship them all across. But no, he just divided the water. So if your back's against the wall now, God can still part it and give you a way across. You know, the Hebrew children, when they were in the midst of a fire now, 
to me, I'd want him to put the fire out before I went in there. But God allowed them to survive in the midst of the fire. Didn't even get to smell of smoke on them. Goliath, slain by a teenage boy when he had a whole army shaking in their boots. So God's ways are not our ways. And don't get so tunnel vision that you think, now, in order for me to experience this, this is the way it's got to happen for God to do it. Just say, God, you're God. You handle this however you want to. You take care of it however you want to and when you want to. I just want to thank you that you're doing it, that it's taken care of. You know, we're real bad about saying a certain time, a certain way for God to meet our needs, to give us our desire to take care of our problem. And when it doesn't happen that way, we lose our faith. And when you lose your faith, I, to me, faith is like a valve on a pipeline. You open that valve by faith, and when you lose your faith, it just shuts back down. It shuts all the blessings of God from flowing in your life. Real faith is not moved by time or circumstances, only by what the Word of God says. People say, well, that's, Brother Larry, you don't know this. I know what the Word says about it. I know what God says about it. You know, George Mueller lived in England, and during his lifetime in England, he raised over one million pounds. Now, that's a lot of money back in those days. That's the whole, nowadays, it's, we throw billions and trillions like it's nothing. But that was a tremendous amount of money, and he raised that for his orphanage. And it all come from the Lord without pleas or advertising. He had nobody behind him, no denomination whatsoever. Mueller was on board a ship, and the captain had been on bridge for 24 straight hours due to the thick fog. He never left it. Mueller finally went to the captain. He said, I've come to tell you I must be in Quebec on Saturday afternoon. And the captain looked at him and said, it's impossible. Mueller said, very well, if your ship cannot take me, God will find some other way. I've never broken engagement in 57 years. Let's go down to the chart room and pray. The captain looked at that man of God. He wondered what lunatic asylum he had come from. Listen, people think you lost your mind when you begin to stand on the word of God and begin calling those things that be not as though they were. He had never heard of such a thing. He said, Mr. Mueller, can you not see how dense the fog is? And Mueller replied, no, no. My eyes not on the density of the fog, but on the living God who controls every circumstance of my life. Then he knelt and prayed a simple prayer. The captain, when he finished, I was going to pray, but he put his hand on my shoulder and told me not to pray. He said, I don't want you to pray. Do you not believe that he will answer? And I believe he has. There's no need for you to pray about it whatsoever. The captain looked at Mueller and said, and Mueller told him, he said, I've known my Lord for 57 years, and there has never been a day when I failed to get an audience with the king. Get up, open the door, and you will find the fog is gone. The captain went to the deck. The fog was completely gone, and Mueller kept his Saturday afternoon appointment. A man of faith, a man of God, willing to, to believe what God told him. Some of you are sitting out there, saying, Brother Larry, you telling me in order to get my needs met, my problems solved, and my desires, I have to believe and confess it's done before it happens? No, I'm not. But Jesus is. Amen. If he were to appear to you today and stand right in front of you and quote those verses, would you believe him then? Well, he's doing it. He does it in Matthew 21 and Mark 11. It says it's for every believer. Ever whatsoever. We should be living in Mark 11, 23, 24, because to me it's a cornerstone of the Christian walk. If you read his testimony, you'll find that it raised Ken Hagen out of his deathbed. it will do the same for you. It'll, God's no respecter of persons. Well, I think a real good thing, it says in Mark 11, 23, 24, where it says, whosoever, just put your name in there. And then whatever that mountain is, if it's 
whatever need it is, just call that Mount Finances, Mount uh, Depression, Mount Grief, whatever, and make it more personalized. And then put that in your Bible and begin to speak it and confess it and call it done. Let's have a word of prayer right quick. Satan, we bind you off this brother in the name of Jesus Christ. We command you to leave his presence. And in the name of Jesus, and by his stripes, Delton is healed. He's whole and he's feeling good. We rebuke and call it healed in Jesus Christ's name. Do we have a wheelchair? Yeah, the wheelchair.
Do what? Yeah, we just pray for him. We're just going to thank God that he's healed. We just pray for him while go. <clears throat> Father, we thank you that in the name of Jesus that Delton's healed. He's feeling better. And Father, we just thank you by the stripes of Jesus. He's healthy from head to toe. And Jesus, we give you the praise and the glory. Amen. Let's go ahead and put Mark 11, 23 up there, James. Thank you.
do one. Hey, we'll get it in. They're, they're just checking Delta and out. Says his blood pressure 130 something over 70. Amen. Amen. Let's go ahead while they're taking care of Delta. I'm going to tell you something. We put Mark 11, 23 up on the screen. And Satan will do anything he can to keep you from hearing something that's going to bless you, take care of you. He, I believe he had an attack on Delta. And what Delta's doing, there's a good godly man right there, but Satan will do anything to get your eyes off the Word of God and off Jesus Christ. What you need to do is you need to take Mark 11, 23 and 24. And whatever your need is, whatever your problem is, your desire is, write it down. And just ask yourself, be honest, am I meeting the conditions to see God, give God the ability to answer my needs or my problems? Because until you meet the conditions, God can't do anything. Once you meet the conditions, it's over in his ballpark. And... Uh, I want us to get just like Mueller was. Our eyes is not on the fog, but it's on the one that controls the fog. Our eyes is not on the one that's causing the problems or trouble, but it's on the one that takes care of the problems and the trouble. And I don't care what you're dealing with, it's not as big as God is. Amen.
<laughs> Have a good ride, Delton. Let's see if they'll let you blow the siren. <laughs> hey, I know how that is. Do what the woman says. Amen. <clears throat> Give me my hand clap. Thank you, God, for your healing. Yeah, I know how between my PT people and my wife, that's the reason why I've come along. God is as good as I've done. My wife, she keeps me in line. Like I say, folks, write these down. And then you'd be surprised how many problems and things God can handle if we'll just do what he says and tells us to do. And uh, I, I don't think all this is by accident this morning. I think he's trying to jerk some people's eyes off what his word says and getting your things taken care of. Write it down, put it in your Bible. Instead of worrying about it, begin thanking God that it's taken care of, it's answered. That problem's gone, and I don't care what it is. God's not limited. You know, Mark 9, 23 doesn't say, you know, a few things are possible. Some things are possible, but all things are possible if you can believe, and if you can believe. I'm going to ask you to stand. Father, we just thank you, first of all, that Delton's healed. He's strong. His body's healthy from head to toe. And, Father, we thank you for your word, and your word means what it says. And, Father, forgive us for just putting up with junk, allowing Satan to rob and steal from us, our joy, our peace, our health. And, Father, just open our eyes to what's available. Father, we were born in your family to be blessed, to live an abundant life. And, Father, when a thief's caught, he has to restore, and we've caught him. Father, I thank you that everyone here today with any problem, any need or desire, that as they begin to walk in these scriptures, Father, that all those are taken care of. And Father, we thank you for it in Jesus' name and all God's people said. Amen. Every head bowed and eye closed for just a few moments.